experts today about the complicated state of internet rules and policy and who's enforcing them. Um, here we have Chip Pickering, the CEO of Encompass, a trade group uh, that encompasses, I'm sorry, I had to do it, um, <laughs> encompasses uh, both carriers and the, the tech sector. Um, we've got Larry Irving, former head of NTIA, and all of you nerds know what that is. <laughs> and uh, he's now president and CEO of the Irving Group. We also have Roslyn Layton, uh, who is a visiting scholar in these issues at AI, the American Enterprise Institute. She's also a scholar at Aalborg University in Denmark mm -hmm. and also working for Strand Consult over there. Busy schedule. <laughs> We have John Liebowitz, who's a partner in the antitrust practice at Davis Polk. And we have Chris Lewis, who's a VP at Public Knowledge. Uh, let's give these speakers a welcome hand. <laughs> Excellent. So I'm not planning for this to be a you know, brutal back and forth net neutrality net neutrality policy fight, but I have to warn you, I will step in and break it up if it gets <laughs> physical, so keep it cool, guys. Uh, we will be talking about, you know, what is the role of regulators uh, in this complicated age of the internet when Netflix streaming is driving the bottom line and driving our entertainment world. Uh, so, guys, feel free to to just weigh in, all of you, uh, what do you see the regulators' roles uh, in tech and telecom today? Many of you are former, uh, former policymakers, former legislators, and former regulators yourselves. So why don't we start with you, Chip? You know, for, for, from my perspective, it's, it's pretty clear the 1996 Act, the law, law on which we now do telecom policy, is to promote competition and new networks. The universal uh, uh, deployment of all the new networks and technologies and advancement of technologies and to do it in a way that promotes competition. Mm -hmm. I, think that's, I think that's right. Um, you know, the, there's always been a tension between what the FCC does, what the FTC does, um, the question of self-regulatory models. You know, 25 years ago this week, I joined the Clinton administration with 15 million people on the internet. 15, one five, total, globally, <laughs> one five. When we started 25 years ago, and we laid out a framework for, uh, for the discussion about internet policy, and we, at the time, said we need light touch regulation, and we believed that. But we had babies and you know infants in swaddling clothes. We now have behemoths that bestride the earth, and so we need to think about what's the balancing act. We don't want to overregulate one sixth of our economy. By the same token, no one expected we were talking around the back room that 40 million households would have an open mic in their household. They called an echo that gives no privacy assurances as to how it's going to be used or when it's going to be used or where it's going to be used, and it's eminently hackable. So it's got to be a dynamic. You, you want the government to do the minimal possible, but everything possible to uh, protect consumers. And the thing is, the whole deal doesn't work if it's not about consumers and competition. And what I worry about what's happening in Washington right now is it's too much about the corporate interest and not about the public interest. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so I think it's very simple. The job of the regulator is to put itself out of business. And I'm glad that we have these uh, veterans from the Clinton era. I mean, it was a brilliant example. I would love to bring that bipartisanship back. That is what this state of the net is all about. And you know, one of the brilliant uh, things to come out of that era, uh, uh, Chairman uh, Kennard at the time had a plan for modernizing the FCC uh, that would put it more along the lines of the FTC. I think that is long overdue. The FCC has not been reauthorized in 30 years, you know, about 27, 30 years, quite a long time. Interestingly, you know, the country where uh, I live a lot of the year in, in Denmark, they took uh, Chairman Kennard's plan and implemented it. And they're the top digital nation in the world. So there's no telecom regulator there. They took those responsibilities and distributed them across a variety of agencies because they said, we're not doing our job if, in fact, we still have the regulator there. The competition has not been achieved. So I want to put the regulator's toes to the fire and get the job done. If competition is what you want, 
you know, then then you need you need to see those those things happening. Yeah, and let me let me. Uh, I, I think those are all good points. I want to just add, point out that Chip, by the way, was not a part of the Clinton administration. He was very <laughs> partisan when he was a Republican member of Congress. But we paid a lot of attention to him. a staffer for yeah. Trump. <laughs> yeah. um, uh, uh, but look, and, and by the way, I should point out that although I am uh, most of the time an antitrust uh, attorney, I also am a co-chair of the 21st Century Privacy Coalition. It's a collection of broadband um, uh, companies who really do believe in privacy. Um, but I, I want to go back to a point that Larry made, which is it's about competition and it's about consumers. And so when, uh, this is my view at least, uh, and I think it's the view of, of, of a lot of people, that the sky didn't fall for corporations when Title II was imposed, and the sky has definitely not fallen uh, for, uh, for consumers uh, with Title II uh, uh, being, we'll see what happens in the courts, uh, uh, with Title II being repealed, because the truth is, there's a muscular agency, the FTC. I see some FTC people in the audience now. Go flex your muscles, Charlotte, if you want. And, um, and they are going to continue to do consumer protection cases and competition cases. And if you look at the Justice Department's, I don't have a position on this, but if you look at the Justice Department's um, case about, um, uh, about uh, uh, trying to block AT&T Time Warner, that's about vertical foreclosure, as was the FTC's 19, uh, 2000 order um, uh, that prohibited discrimination uh, by broadband providers when it approved uh, AOL Time Warner. So I actually think that uh, there is sort of a there is a pathway forward. Um, my guess is that most of us probably aren't that far away from agreement about what that pathway might be. Um, and, and hopefully, at some point, when the dust settles on, on, on Title II, um, uh, uh, you know, Congress will think about um, what it wants to do, and it can work for consumers and for competition. Because I think the other point I would make, um, and then I will quit bloviating. Where's Tim? He told me not to say that word, but I, so I apologize. <laughs> um, um, and the other thing is that the better solution is a federal solution. It is not a crazy quilt patchwork of state laws. I don't even know that you could do net neutrality at the state level because of uh, the clear preemption language. And I think privacy is a, not a very good idea either. So um, I'm glad we have some agreement here because I agree with Larry. It is about competition and it is about consumers. Um, and if we can agree on that, then I think we can you know, find some solutions in policy. But to the question, what, you know, what is the role of, of regulators? I think what we need from regulators right now is some leadership. And, and we're seeing an abdication of leadership uh, with the, the current ruling on F on, at the FCC on net neutrality. But we also, it's not just about net neutrality. There's so many mm -hmm. other issues going on in, in the communications policy space uh, that we need leadership on from, from, from multiple agencies, not just the Federal Communications Commission. But when we have that sort of leadership, when we have, uh, and it's not always about rulemaking, sometimes it's about bringing people together to talk about policies, mm -hmm. uh, then legislators, other policymakers can, can take big ideas from that and figure out the way to structure uh, the authority for these agencies to protect consumers. Because if it's not structured properly, it will not keep up with the pace of innovation and technology. Mm -hmm. Well, let's talk about uh, let's talk a little more about who's minding the store, so to speak. Uh, I want to talk about this sort of transition to more FTC enforcement authority over uh, ISPs, for example. Uh, John, what do you think about the idea of antitrust laws being able to rein in a lot of this, uh, a lot of the behavior that? proponents of Title II really were worried about? Um, I, I think it has the capacity mm -hmm. uh, to absolutely do that with, uh, with leadership at my former agency and at the Justice Department. Um, there are now four new nominees for the FTC, and I think a fifth is coming soon, so that is a good sign. And keep in mind that um, up until, you know, for the first 15 or 20 years uh, of the Internet, there was no Title II. Right? It was the FTC and the Justice Department that brought a number of cases and wrote a privacy report that was lauded by consumer groups. And, and so, I, I, again, I think for most of the concerns um, that a, a lot of people have, antitrust and consumer protection um, is, uh, is critically important and, 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 and can do a really good job in protecting consumers um, from bad behavior by anybody. Mm -hmm. So it'll surprise no one who knows me that I'm going to strike the first discordant note on this panel. Um, <laughs> I have a lot of respect for the FTC, but the FTC is not the right agency to manage or to regulate um, privacy over the Internet. Um, the FCC, you know, for those of us who have been watching the FTC with regard to do not call, 
and read the uh, Washington Post article just a couple of weeks ago where they have completely bollocked that job up, to give them the additional responsibility of monitoring everything that happens in telecommunications with regard to privacy would just be an abrogation of responsibility. Now, folks, why do we need you know, too many cops on the beat? I live in Woodley Park. I've got park police, Secret Service police, DC police, Metro police, all, and I'm happy that all of them are there, and they all have a different role. The FCC's role has historically, traditionally, and currently different. I did not agree with Title II um, when Chairman Wheeler, my, old, my good friend of long standing, I don't have any old friends anymore, but friends of long standing, <laughs> a friend of long standing, Tom Wheeler, I did not agree with him when he imposed Title II. I thought that was a huge mistake. Mm -hmm. I think it's a complete abrogation of his responsibility for Chairman Pai, my other younger friend, to um, say, well, we're not going to do this anymore. We can give it to the FTC. The FTC looks at uh, deception, they look at antitrust, but they, you know, the CPNI regulations at the FCC, the FCC's long history of protecting consumers with regard to how their personal data is used is a proud and long and distinguished history. And say, we're going to just stop doing this and hand over to the FTC. It's just wrong. It's wrong as a matter of policy, it's wrong as a matter of politics. Okay, so the former uh, Clinton administration, the former Republican congressmen are going to strike another bipartisan agreement. <laughs> Now, the FCC is the correct agency. It has the expertise, the uh, experience, and the resources. And the resources. So you're, a you're asking the FTC, which is, you know, just, you're, it's like asking the Peace Corps to be your Marines. It's just not the right fit. And so we, we need the FCC uh, to take its responsibility uh, to enforce. And this is, and, and to my friend uh, John, who's, as you look at antitrust, it is a post-failure action. Uh, my last vote in Congress was the 2008 too big to fail financial failure. Mm -hmm. We are just now as a nation recovering from the collapse and the cost of not taking preventive pro-competition steps that's like a doctor's visit that prevents you from getting really sick and then having a much higher cost of your me medical bills. Competition policy at the FCC can keep the market healthy, functioning, and our country much more prosperous. So Tara, let me jump in here. I'm glad that the gentlemen are so concerned about consumer privacy and that they, they, are, they think that uh, the FCC is up to task. What I think is, uh, what doesn't add up here though, is prior to 2015, no one was saying the FTC wasn't doing their job on privacy. This all happened because of the common carry exemption being revoked. And it just created, uh, you know, it, it, it just created this, uh, this, this thing suddenly became an issue. So if, in fact, there was a problem, why weren't consumer groups pointing it out? FTC's not doing its job or something like that. This was, a, uh, this was the idea to bring over something that the FCC was, didn't work on. They, didn't, they weren't using you know, evidence-based methods. They invented it on the fly. And it was, it's also created this asymmetry so customers would then have some expectation that there would be rules that, that they had on one place would apply to the other. And it's a seamless experience. So this is, was actually a very bad thing for consumers. And I'm really glad that Congress did what they needed to do and say you know, that they disapproved of that. Well, I don't know if it was invented on the fly. There were many months of deliberations. Uh, it was rooted in the framework of the uh, Title II uh, privacy rules, the CPNI rules that Larry was talking about. I mean, you don't have to agree with Title II uh, to agree with some of the basic principles that came out of those rules, um, that consumers have, should have control over their data, that uh, consumers uh, should uh, have an opportunity to, uh, to opt out uh, when it's used in certain ways. And, and a lot of that was in what you know, John and folks worked on at, at the Federal Trade Commission. So uh, there's no reason why uh, you can't have multiple cops on the beat, uh, but, but especially to have an agency that is specific to a sector. We see it over and over again, an agency that knows a sector very well, that's empowered to work in that sector. Uh, when it's a sector like telecommunications that lends itself towards local monopolies, towards lack of choice of, for consumers, uh, that's when you need that robust sort of power that the FCC offers. And, and we see it over and over again in other areas of privacy. Let, let, me, let me just add one thing, because I think everyone has made really important points here. And I feel like I'm somewhere in the middle between the, uh, the, 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 the right and the left here. But it is worth pointing out, one, that the FTC has brought cases, some when I was there, some after I left, against Facebook, Google, Google again, Google again on competition, yeah. um, Twitter, Comcast, Dish Network, 
Um, and I'm sure I'm, I'm leaving, and has a case pending, and the Ninth Circuit decision is going to be important, as we all know there's an en banc there, um, against, uh, against AT&T for bandwidth throttling, which is a supreme evil of net neutrality. So it's not as if the FTC has ever rolled over and played dead. Now, to Chip's point, it is, it is mostly a, it's an enforcement agency rather than a regulator for the most part. There are a few rules that it enforces, like can't spam, but for the most part, it does not. And so I actually think there is probably room for some sort of ex-ante regulation, but I would much rather have it done by Congress than by the states or by, for example, the FCC, because the FCC has a tendency, and I have a lot of respect for the people who are there now. I have a lot of respect for Tom Wheeler and Julie Janikowski and I are, are really good friends. We played basketball every weekend, and we, uh, we spent a lot of time together when we were We'll take you on two on two. Any day you want to. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'm not going to take, take you up on that. Yeah. Uh, no, but we is, play a game, and the winner gets to. <laughs> you know, he has a few deception moves, as I think about it. But, um, but, uh, but the, you, you want rules of the road that if you're going to have ex ante rules that are bipartisan because bipartisan rules are the ones that last and that won't you know change overnight with different administrations and, and that's why i kind of think if 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 there is a will in congress um after the dust settles on all of the appeals and um the uh the the, the marquee cra to do a rulemaking uh, to do essentially to do a statute that would be sort of like a rulemaking that's the place to do it so can I I think all of us would love to see legislation on all of us. You're just a discordant note everywhere, aren't you? <laughs> no, no, but, but the likelihood of legislation in the near term is m de minimis. And when you right. see that the folks who would probably blanch the most at um, legislation are Facebook and Google, who also are now spending the most money in Washington, it kind of makes you worry that it wouldn't happen in the near term. To say that the FCC is going to have no, rule, no, no role in privacy is going to go to the FTC, which is not, an, uh, you know, and, and most of the time your, your relief is after you're dead, um, if, if you're lucky. Th this is not a good thing. And for those of us who are excited about the privacy regime we have right now, you know, under the FTC's existing thing with regard to internet providers, please, please raise your hand, because I've got some concerns about, you know, a, a generation of people growing up saying there is no privacy. Anybody under 30, when you talk to them, says there is no privacy. And part of that's because we in Washington have led them to believe it. So if those of us who want privacy want it, we've got to work at the grassroots level. We need to have the FCC back in one more cop on the beat. Let the FCTC do the things it used to do, and let's fight for legislation. But to sit here and assume legislation is going to happen without some kind of a proactive effort is, is, is fool's goal. Well, well, let me create the record just real quickly. Both Internet Association and Encompass supported you know, negotiations on the legislation that would be new title, same protections. And that, I think, as, as John and I talk, net neutrality, there's a broad consensus that we should have non-discrimination as a principled policy. And, and blocking, throttling, prioritization, really, at, at its heart, is a non-discrimination policy. And to make sure that also interconnection has the same protections and the same principle applied to it in, in oversight. I think everyone knows that's the deal. But when's the question it going to happen? Is, can, can it happen in this political environment? And, that, and that's the thing I worry about. I, mean, I, I know what the deal is. I mean, I was going to raise it a little later, but, you know, I've got, last week I ran into Kristen Smith, who used to work for Olympia Snow. 2006, Olympia Snow introduced a net neutrality bill yep. that was not Title II and that was signed on by, oh, Senator Obama, Senator Clinton, Senator Wyden, and, Rep and Senator Snow. Now, we could take, the, you know, we could tweak that bill tomorrow, but we can't get it passed. I mean, that's, that's the path is to all of these we're talking about right here could be resolved if you get a piece of legislation that got rid of Title II, that took care of all the protections, no throttling, um, no paid prioritization, it gave all of the protections you want net neutrality, but for 12 years we've been fighting the same issue. How is that possible? So now we're talking about privacy, we're going to wait another 12 years on privacy, meanwhile we'll have 300 households, 300 million households that are going to have these little um, devices that, you know, are microphones in our homes telling everything in the world where someone can be hacked. This is an insane situation and until there's leadership, we're not going to get past it. And I'm glad to see that you and Michael are, you know, are willing to de um, develop some leadership, but we need leadership on the Hill, and we need the progressive organizations to really fight for this as hard as they fought for net neutrality. Larry, if I could pile on, I mean, uh, we, if we wait years for net neutrality bill, then we wait years for a privacy bill, then imagine all the things that are coming up now that people are just starting to understand about new technology that wouldn't be resolved yeah, exactly. if we don't create something more comprehensive. 
Um, so, uh -oh. so Robin's so out there. We're gonna have the, the, the <laughs> hyperventilation. Look, every time there's a new technology, everyone's oh my God, the the camera, the radio, it's all gloom and doom, you know. And then we all calm down, you know. And then it becomes part of our life. I know there are business models in making people scared about new things. I'll start with old technology. How about TV and the lack of diversity and the lack of consumer choice for independent voices? Something called the internet came along, disrupted yes. television, and it is in danger. So the the of only other side I want to get out in this, this, this debate here. Here is that we also have to realize there is the downside of regulation creating these very problems we have today. It's no coincidence that because the uh, you know for for a long time we we put the thumb on the scale and said oh edge providers they're better. Well gee is it a surprise now that they're all the all the oligopoly and the behemoths and everyone's worried about them because the regime was favoring them. Right? Because we didn't allow competition there. We had asymmetrical regulation. That's not a fair state of competition. The same thing with privacy. We want to have, a, everybody wants to have lower prices to connect to the internet. Well, wouldn't it be something if the biggest users of the bandwidth actually paid something? We take the, the burden off the consumers to pay. You know, that's a, would be a fantastic kind of competition I would like to see. But we've had a policy that says, no, we're going to make the consumers pay 100%. Well, no wonder people are upset. If we talk about consumers, they have a right to to and to go in a world where there's different business models, there's different ways. The regulator's not putting the thumb on the scale. Roslyn, you make a great point, and you've all made great points about these things. Um, and in addition to, you bring up something that I wanted to to discuss, and that's you know when we talk about bad behavior of of in the internet economy, we're not just talking about blocking and throttling, and particularly if you talk to Chairman Pai or Commissioner O'Reilly, um, or you know, any, any, of, any of the telecom folks uh, who are, are, are supportive of what Chairman Pai did, they'll bring up, you know, well, uh, Google and Twitter and Facebook uh, prioritize certain things in, in different lanes and things like that too, and then you'll have the response to that debate uh, point, which is that that's not really the same thing because they, they're not in charge of the pipes. I mean, I would love to hear your guys' uh, thoughts on like what bad behavior are we talking about when we talk about the the big tech side of things. Well, I'll give you one example. Yeah. I spend a lot of time in the valley. I went to school out there. I'm out there mm -hmm. a lot. And in my conversations with VCs, in in, in fact, the most recent conversation in just uh, before Christmas, the the size the requirement now that if you're not part of the ecosystem of a few companies, you can't get funding. Mm -hmm. And VCs certainly are just not going to fund consumer-facing companies mm -hmm. that are either in the sight line or that might compete with some of the biggest companies. Now, if you want innovation, you want competition, that is not a good place to be. We're not having that conversation here in Washington. Nobody's saying what's really happening with regard to the ecosystem out there. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I use, as anybody out there knows me on Facebook, I use Facebook a lot. You know, I'm on Google like everybody else. But I'm, you know, Amazon, so my best friends work at Amazon. But, you know, when I, when I, when I, when I, that line, but, but when, um, nevertheless, go ahead. Nevertheless, when, when, you, when you start looking at the stranglehold they have over competition, innovation, and what happens in terms of what was a very vibrant ecosystem just a few years ago, it's frightening. And no one really wants to go on the record and talk about it loudly because they all want their exit event, and VCs still have to deal with those companies and have portfolio companies that are involved in them. So, so I think you make a great point, and that's why I think you really want a, an agency with general <laughs> oversight <laughs> applying symmetrical rules and enforcement uh, and using its enforcement authority um, whenever anyone either engages in an unfair and deceptive act of practice or, you know, engages in a violation of Sherman Act, the FTC's jurisdiction, as you know, Larry, is a little bit broader. It goes, you can go after unfair methods of competition. Because if you, and, and this was the issue I had, I think, initially with, um, with uh, the privacy rule, right? It wasn't, it wasn't based, it was based on who collected the information. It wasn't based, as we all know, on what it, I think what it ideally should be, which is what information um, is, is, is collected and how it's being That's used. used. Yeah. And, and how often mm -hmm. it has changed. I mean, the biggest, the biggest, you know, people tell you, talk about notice and choice. And again, you know, I'm running it back and forth to Europe back in 1995, 96, and, and arguing that notice and choice, who's actually read a notice and how many of you actually feel you have a choice with regard to that notice? Now, m my point is, you need both the FCC and the FTC, and you need some, and you need symmetrical regulation. What we have right now is the worst of, of, of all worlds. You've got the FTC kind of, sort of, with some responsibility, FCC abrogating it completely, and you have an asymmetrical world. How is that possibly working for anybody? So, 
So, uh, you know, she asked a question about harms. So you guys have dove in deep into privacy. Let's talk about bias and, and, and how uh, platforms and services online are biased against uh, small actors, biased against uh, minorities, and, and reflect our own biases in their own algorithms. No one's talking about how to deal with that. You talk about harms with uh, people having access to the technology, access to broadband, and affordable access uh, so that it's ubiquitous to everyone. We're still trying to deal with that. So there are mm -hmm. a number of harms beyond net neutrality, beyond privacy, that need to be integrated into comprehensive legislation. Mm -hmm. Let me, uh, I think, plug into this debate and go back to something that Rosalind said. You know, I believe in comparative economics. I believe that there are better business models and there are worse business models as far as innovation, investment, growth, consumer welfare, consumer benefit. And from my perspective, uh, the internet business model is a better business model than the traditional infrastructure business models that we've had for the last 100 years and evolved over uh, the last 30 years. One is of abundance, and one monetizes scarcity. And so if you're monetizing abundance, you get the values that Google, Amazon, Facebook, and Twitter, because from an economic point of view, it is more efficient, it's more global, it's more open, it's interconnected, it's interoperable. Those are the cornerstones of free market capitalism that grows the economy at the highest rate and, and for the best benefit of everyone. Networks, uh, if you keep them open and interconnected, they allow all of the apps of the internet economy to multiply, to expand, and to be abundant. We get the streaming revolution that we have today, which is actually superior to the, get, to the bundled cable TV market. It's what consumers want. It is a much more efficient allocation of resources. From an economic point of view, the drive of the internet demand drives investment into the infrastructure. It is not a zero-sum game. It is virtuous in that it, it builds both. And if we keep networks open, I think the competition issues of the platforms will, will continue to be a positive effect for our country. Well, I think it's great that, um, you know, there should be competition in business models, but we don't need the regulator to decide. I mean, the consumers decide for themselves. There's no need I for mean, the regulator to come back and say it has to be this way or that way, because if you're right, the consumers did choose that model. I mean, the, 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 the challenge economic is... economic relativism. There is better and worse. Right. And you have to make, as a policymaker, what is a better business model? What is a better allocation of capital? And the Internet model is superior, I think, to the traditional models that we're beginning to disrupt and displace and eventually over time replace in a way that's beneficial to both sides of the market, the infrastructure and the content. Well, I think that's great, but we don't need, so if that's the case, we should allow then those folks with copper networks to retire them and put in fiber. We have, we've got rules on the books that say you need to maintain that. So why don't we allow that? But that's instead, so the folks, the folks want to come in and say, oh, open is this way. I'm defining it the way that I want. Well, it, maybe it's convenient to some players and not to others. All right. Well, th that's just not true. There's a whole proceeding that the FCC went through to describe how you transition your network off of copper fiber, uh, co off copper onto fiber. And if we only were following it and didn't roll back the protections that were included in that, then everyone would be brought along. And this is what I'm talking about, about including and making sure everyone has access to technology. But we have to you know, make these transitions. You have to sometimes have a regulator whose job it is to make sure that these transitions in technology happen in a way that don't leave people behind. Yeah, and, and, and let me, it, it, it's a good point. And let me, let me just come back to your point, Rosalind, because I agree with you that you want, and Larry, you said this too. I mean, if you have regulation, you want it to be a light touch for the most part. That was your vision when you were at NTIA. And I think at 100,000 feet, people really agree with that. But you do need an enforcement agency. I don't know that you're disagreeing with this, when people or companies cross the line. So when I was at the FTC in 2006, 2007, we were facing a spyware problem where some companies were putting, a, you know, were putting technology in cookies in people's cookies, actually. They were putting technology in people's computers that served ads, and they made it impossible for you to get that technology out. And people had to destroy their computers. And we stopped. You know, we went after the three or four big spyware purveyors, and we stopped that. And you also need competition. Uh, 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 you also need to have uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, an agency that goes after companies when they violate uh, 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 competitive norms or the Sherman Act. So um, we brought a case against Google because they had committed to licensing on uh, Fran terms, fair, reasonable, and non-discriminatory. 
And when it turned out some of those licensees were their competitors in the marketplace, they started jacking up the prices, okay? We believe, or four out of five commissioners in a bipartisan vote, believe that that was an antitrust violation or an unfair method of competition. And so if you're gonna, I don't think you disagree with this, but if you're not going to have a regulatory approach, you do really need enforcement authority and you need a hammer behind that enforcement authority. Sure. What happens when, you know, you've got all this, I mean, convergence in, in the tech and telecom spaces is nothing new, but what happens when it gets so muddled that, say, an ISP is also a content provider or owns a content provider? And not, not a veiled AT&T Time Warner reference, um, <laughs> just a general uh, thought about the trends in the marketplace. What happens when the lines get blurred? Or what should happen with the regulators? So I would say mm -hmm. that's exactly where antitrust can be really valuable. So if you go back to the, I don't want to talk about AT, let's put at and Time Warner aside for a second, but if you go back to the 2000 order that the FTC had in, um, in AOL Time Warner, mm -hmm. um, it prohibited discrimination against other broadband providers. You can't do that. And it was trying to protect upstream content and downstream consumers. And uh, and so you can easily envision, you could envision a way in which vertically integrated companies um, have, uh, you know, are, are foreclosing competition um, and they have potentially monopoly power. If that's the case, you want agencies to go after them. I don't think that's an insolvable matter. It's not, but it's also not one that is easily susceptible to regulations because it's always going to be a fact specific inquiry. Mm -hmm. And it's not like it's brand new. I mean, cable companies have owned content provider, uh, um, content companies for years. Google had Google Fiber and they owned YouTube. Um, you're looking at um, a history of the FCC and the FTC ensuring that folks didn't do self-dealing. And, and, I, and I do think there's a role for, again, both agencies. But federal communication, you know, even going back to FinCEN, the national syndication rules, which is long before you were born, but that, <laughs> that, that was the net neutrality of my day. Uh, we spent 20 years on that issue. We've had lots of, of issues where we've had to look at the issue of who owns what content, who, um, you know, the, the whole question whether or not movie theaters could also own production studios. Mm -hmm. None of these are new issues. Some were done at the FCC, some were done by the courts, and some were done um, at the FCC. And we've, we've dealt with it. So I don't know why all of a sudden that's going to become an insurmountable issue that we can't deal with. And, and by the way, with the number of, of content providers today and the minimal um, uh, penetration that any one content provider has on any network today, you'd be kind of stupid because you'd be ticking off your customer by saying, I'm going to put my stuff in a, in a favorable position vis-a-vis -vis everything else out there in the universe, even though if you, you know, a big show now gets 20 million people. Mm -hmm. Back at, you know, Mass had, what, 150 million people at the last show? I mean, you, you, you have a completely different dynamic. I don't know that any one company, one, has enough of the marketplace, and two, has enough at stake by any content it owns that it's going to do something incredibly stupid that's going to get itself in trouble with both the regulators and consumers by, by um, favoring its content. Well, mm -hmm. So convergence is a dynamic process. I mean, the, the, so things are con they're converging and diverging all the time. I mean, if we went back in time and, and you know, we looked at the, at the wheel and it was added to a, to a wagon, I mean, we would have said, well, oh my goodness, the car, parts of the car came from different things. I mean, well, so if we go into the future, we would be laughing that we're having this conversation today. I mean, of course things would converge and then diverge. And it's not a, necessarily a problem. What, this is what has changed about this debate? That's what, I'm, that's what I'm curious about, because we have been having variations on this theme for quite a while. What, what in, in your views, is, is different this time around? Is it just that we're obsessed with Netflix more than ever? Is it, is it the commerce aspect of the internet? Like, what's, what's different uh, about this iteration? Well, if, if you think about the age of Google, Amazon, Facebook, Twitter, you're talking about somewhere between nine and 19 years old. Yep. 19. I mean, not old enough to drink. Mm -hmm. And so they've been emerging, evolving, and going from new entrants and, and small to now dominant as far as uh, their ability uh, to shape the market and to, to, uh, to grow. Uh, going back to the, to the question of, of how do you maintain competition policy that's, that helps consumers both in the tech space as well as in the network space. And that's, you know, it, net neutrality is, is good for both sides of the market from a consumer point of view and to address potential harms. The reason that the Trump administration really has no 
alternative than to, to, to try to block AT&T Time Warner is that there's no remedy for them on the regulatory side today after the action of the FCC that, that keeps the, the, the affiliated content of AT&T and Time Warner from being favored and having the means and the motive to do so. The old net neutrality was a competition policy that provided a remedy for that. That today no longer exists because of the action. And so if you have good common sense uh, competition policy that can be sustained both politically and legally, I think it answers a lot of these questions and allows both sides to grow in a much more uh, reasonable way. Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, we, we've entered into a place in our politics where everything is tribal and zero sum. That's and, and in that place, which communications policy has unfortunately fallen into as well, it, uh, we haven't found a way to compromise. And so, you know, uh, then when you look at a merger, uh, it becomes do you block it or do you keep it? Instead of, uh, uh, you know, some folks want to say, should there be conditions on it? Well, that's short term. Perhaps you put conditions and then you have an evaluation afterwards to see if there needs to be long term regulations mm -hmm. because there's long term effects of that merger. But that's something that can be evaluated by an expert agency, by competition policy experts um, at the FTC or, or the FCC, uh, depending on the, the, the right jurisdiction. I, I agree with Larry, I think it's a mix of the two. Mm -hmm. uh, but to, to be able to have. Um, mandate from Congress and leadership from, from policymakers that finding that balance is the right thing to do is where we need to go with the debate. Mm -hmm. So, a, I, for one, I don't think there's anything new. I mean, is, this is constantly, we've been having, it all, I think it comes back very much to First Amendment. Technologies of freedom are always trying to get out from under the, the, the hand of government. That any time, you know, it's always a, someone has something new. Oh, my goodness, a new company wants to, to work with this. Oh, we have to stop it. I mean, if you look at the history of the regulatory agencies, it's all about stopping on any kind of new technology that wants to emerge. And that is the downside of any kind of regulation that we do here, or we are throttling our First Amendment. Because the innovators themselves, they're the ones who, who have their, their ear to the street, what do people want, want to try, and it's government and regulators who want to come in and control it for their particular political interest. I mean, I, I think with most things, it's, you know, follow the money, and I think this is an argument about money, and it's an argument about power, and it's an mm -hmm. argument about political power in Washington, D.C. <laughs> Chip's point. When you, when you look at when you look at if you're if you're a um, what you know to be called the dumb pipes. I mean, I'm old enough mm -hmm. to remember when everybody looked at the telephone companies built dumb pipes. The higher margin businesses are the content businesses, and they're trying to diversify, and they're also trying to not look at themselves as just telecom companies, but technology companies. Mm -hmm. And that's probably the smart thing to do for the investors. You have a whole other range of companies that look at these guys and say, wait a minute, if they're in this business, they're going to be competing directly with me, and they own the pipe I have to be on. So do I necessarily want that? So what you're basically seeing is, I mean, I, I, we, have see, we saw this fight with broadcast versus cable, so this fight with cable versus satellite. Now we're seeing with regard to some of the Internet players with the, uh, the large Internet companies. Having helped write the 82 Cable Act, the 84 Cable Act, the 92 Cable Act, uh, the 96 Telecom Act, I've seen this play over and over and over again. Every incumbent tries to stop a new entrant, and every new entrant tries to stop the incumbent from getting into the new business. And we're mm -hmm. seeing it playing it out again. I will okay. say this. Going to 84 divestiture, 92 Cable Act, 93 competitive wireless auctions, 96 Telecom Act that opened the local market, each time the incumbents opposed, and each time not only did the new entrants grow, but the, but the incumbents, incumbents grew. valuations grew. Exactly this is not right. a zero-sum game. And it should never be. Yeah. And but competition is the only thing, like when you had monopoly or duopoly, you had one service, old uh, technologies, digital, only through competition did you get multiple services, abundance, and greater values for both sides of the market. But we always managed the competition at the time we had a monopoly and oligopoly so that the co competi competitive market could emerge. We never allowed, uh, just say, oh, we're going to have competition tomorrow. We always knew it took some time from where we were to where we want it to be. You know, whether you're talking about the three broadcast networks to the, you know, the cable guys trying to start satellite to what we're seeing today, there's always somebody who wants to step on the other guy's head. And what I think the role for regulators is, let's open up these markets, let's let people um, do the best job they can for consumers, and let competition be the ultimate decider. Not regulators, but regulators need to be there to make sure that the folks who have the market power today aren't able to abuse it. One more point, if uh, anyone wants to make it, and then we'll go to a quick audience Q&A. Oh, I was just going to say, I agree with that. And um, actually, if you look at the 
uh, the uh, the NBC Universal Comcast settlement. That's designed to ensure that you know new entrants are protected in some of which some of you represent, um, and some of which I represent. Um, <laughs> but I also represent. Also I represent. I represent the, uh, the, uh, but but, but uh, the, it's designed to protect new entrants in their incipiency. And I think that was also part of the 92 Cable Act, right? It was part of the 92. Yeah. That was a satellite. Um, but, but That's right, exactly what Billy I was thinking Billy Tozan about. went down to the floor of the House and got us the votes to get that bill passed over George Bush's veto. Did some mm -hmm. very good things, did some not so good things, but some very good <laughs> things too. <laughs> Billy, Billy's one of my friends, so I gotta go, I gotta go with the congressman. Okay. So, well guys, oh, sorry, Chris, No, the main thing that I would add to, to this last topic is with, Hopefully, when we look to find these common grounds and get out of the zero-sum game, we also remember basic principles. And there are, the other thing that you get with convergence to, to your past question uh, is convergence has brought us uh, things that were entertainment. So you're talking about the Cable Act uh, and satellite and those competing. It's brought things that were uh, entertainment uh, converged with things that are essential. So mm -hmm. uh, access to employment, is all online now. Mm -hmm. uh, access to healthcare is going to be all, all online. Access to education is moving on online, uh, mm -hmm. and you see it everywhere. Um, and and access to emergency communications is all moving online with this convergence. And so there's a there's basic levels of reliability, um, uh, affordability, and and um, and 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 uh, truthfulness uh, in in consumer protection that has to be maintained. And if we aren't talking about a basic baseline level of of those protections, uh, then then we're not doing it right. We're leaving people out, and so uh, that's hard to do without a regulator. Mm -hmm. uh, Congress can try to legislate it, but uh, as technology changes, the ways in which uh, it needs to be tweaked to protect the most vulnerable uh, has to come from a regulator. Thank you guys so much for this conversation, and we have time for a couple of questions. And we have no questions. <laughs> no, they have. No, we do. Terry, we, we do. Over there. <clears throat> sure. Um, so I have a question. You're talking about regulation in the market. If the market requires that you use serv certain services and there isn't sufficient regulation, how can you say that just pure you know, capitalistic market forces are going to create an environment in which, you know, First Amendment, there's First Amendment protection, there is protection for smaller actors, for less popular ideas, and things like that. Because not everyone who uses a lot of the services has a choice. If you work for, you know, a company that uses the Google platform, if you're a journalist, you have very few choices than to be on social media to do your job. So it's a little bit, I think, of a false um, comparison to say that you know it's it's all about the free market and you can just make a choice to get off or to you know disengage. So I'd be interested to hear your thoughts on that. We all looked at so, you. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, I um, thank you for the question. I didn't get I didn't get your name or your. I'm, I'm Courtney Raj. I'm with the Committee to Protect Journalists. Great. So you know I think it's a great question and. You know, it, it is something that's evolving all the time. I mean, when, what was your world like when there was only newspapers? Um, you know, obviously the digital world was very disruptive for the newspaper business. Uh, but when we look at today, I mean, there are, you know, if I want to communicate, I have so many more channels and options than I would have in the newspaper world. So, um, you know, yes, it's a rough and tumble world and things are, are very different, but do we want to go back to the newspaper world? Maybe some people do, right? So, but, you know, as as a as a as a culture, we decided to move forward to have uh, to have other means. So the idea here is dynamism is being important. It's about evolving to have more choice. More people get online today than they you know. No one was online in the newspaper era. So I think the false choice that you're making is okay. We'll be newspaper forever, and you know that's the one technology, and we'll regulate that and make it perfect. You know, but versus all of the all of the social benefits that we get because new technologies come about. So, you know, I guess maybe I, I don't un understand your question so well where you're sort of saying, you know, it has to stay in one domain and then we can control it versus that we have an evolution to, to new things. Well, I, so. mean, th I mean, the way I heard the question, yeah. I mean, she's really talking about the, the maturation of, of big platforms. I mean, that uh, okay. people don't 
don't see that they have a choice going beyond using Google, you know, using G Suite. Let's use right. as an example. Right. So, uh, so one of the, so I guess so one of the things I'm very passionate about that I I do a lot of my research is actually on user education. I'm actually a big proponent for educating people to be self-aware, to be critical about the media that they that they consume, um, and digital literacy, for example. I think a lot of it is is the important role that we have to take for personal responsibility, their education, families, all kinds of institutions to educate uh, the individual users. Uh, I think if you look at, I've, I've got a paper on privacy where I look at the GDPR in the European Union. Um, they have taken a market-based approach to privacy, but the sad part about it is that they're focusing just on compliance, but there's nothing in that that is sort of focusing on educating users about uh, all of their digital profiles and settings and all the things that a person can do to to protect themselves all of the you know so there's a huge part that's there I don't have a you know there's not one quick and fast thing to do but there's a range of things that have to be done but most importantly I, what I, I think is missing is the user component is how do people have to be more educated about the technology that they consume and the, the way that they do it it's not like the regulators have all the answers either they don't yeah, I think folks feel powerless um, with the lack of choices uh, because uh, we've gone from a place where innovation was coming from small companies and now those small companies are getting swallowed up by bigger companies. That's like, it's a little bit of a trite analysis. I mean, yes, we know there are big companies today, but you're also ignoring how many how many people feel empowered when they're, they don't like XYZ airline or they don't like XYZ whatever and they go to Twitter. That you know, yes, you know, they they right. and they so they don't like. It. So let's say I'm not happy on something. I ret I return it to Amazon and I get a refund. So I mean, I'm, I'm not it's saying I disagree with you. I, I agree that, with yeah. you on on educating consumers about yeah. the technology. There's another level to it because uh, so consumers take, take the feel fake powerless, news, the but fake they also feel empowered. Right Right? Take the fake news concerns right now. Yeah. I mean, people just are worried because they're hearing in the news that they can't trust what they're being, what's coming on their news feed on Facebook. And so at some point, is that the responsibility of the consumer to understand the technology so, and how Facebook works? Or is, it the is there a shared responsibility for the platform to start to find ways in the technology to, to, to solve that? So it's not people uniformly who are concerned about that. Many people would say, look, I recognize the things that I'm not going to believe everything that I read, right? So, I mean, let's not, let's not generalize here. I mean, sure, there are many people who are very concerned, but, right? But, but it doesn't mean if there's, an, oh, this one regulator has it all figured out. I mean, even Gigi that. said that. We've talked about it. She's also concerned about that, you know, the regulator's going to come in and regulate fake news. But I do think we are all concerned about consumers losing control over their data mm -hmm. and also the issue of um, making sure that consumers have access to, you know, good fact-based information. And, um, and in a disruptive time. So and I think we also want to see new innovative companies that aren't bound by the, the strictures yes. of large companies that say it's our way or the highway. And, yes. and I think that was the point that the young woman was asking. Yeah. You know, when you have these dominant companies um, and you don't, you're not able to be flexible with regard to the tools because right. they're basically saying it's our tool or no tool. Right. And so we've got to, how do we, how do we get beyond that? And that is a question I think there is a role, a, a role for the FTC and there is, there is a role for Congress to make sure that innovation is, is permitted. I'm not quite sure what the answers are, but I think the questions you're asking are important questions. I think that sums it up nicely, that debate sums it up nicely. Um, we, maybe one more? One more. Jerry. Our founder. All right. I work with, you know, 90%. I think, he, I think he's projecting. I'm Jerry Berman, <laughs> chair of uh, the Internet Education Foundation. But in my career as a, a public advocate in this space, the first one thing, just, just the wonderful thing about the Internet, it was a footnote in the Telecom Act, and regulators didn't understand it. And so it got off the ground uh, without the rules. It needs rules. What you all have talked about is the need that there is possible a consensus, but no single agency can sort that out, right. one. Two, Congress is a terrible forum for sorting because when people go before Congress, they get into their tribal positions. There needs to be, uh, can you imagine what you guys used to do, Larry, John, Christine Varney, the convening function when you're stuck 
to get the civil society, the corporate side, in a room, however long it takes to sort this out, because Congress is not going to do it by itself. It needs a process. And I'm, I'm wondering whether anyone knows where so, that process is so or where there, you would There go. is no such process. And, and I will bore all of you. I'll take a look at, I think, August of, I'm working on a project right now. 25 years ago, in August or September, we wrote the Agenda for Action for the National Information Infrastructure, we called it Interface to Highway. And we had pulled together, per Jerry's point, everybody around the country, everybody around the globe, and we ended up at the internet, the 15 million people who were on it, and said, what should our, our goals be? And I'm going to take a little bit of difference with you, Jerry. I don't think what we need right now are rules. I think we need principles. I think we've got to get back to foundational principles. What should this look like? What would it look like? And I think progressive communities have got to come together, and conservative communities have got to come together, and maybe we can come together after we have our principles together and say, here's what the world should look like in an internet world that is minimally regulated, but adequately regulated. That's based on consumer protection, innovation, and competition. We don't have that. No one's having those conversations. The conversation in Washington is driven by corporate interests primarily, and I'm not trying to be Bernie Sanders, but you know, the, 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 tel the telcos have their agenda, the um, 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 Internet Association has its agenda, and no one is having the conversation between. Yeah. I mean, Let it go. Get it done. And let's start with principles. Exactly yeah. right. And, and let me just encourage you, Jerry, to convene such a group, right? Yeah. Because, I, because I really believe that there's much more consensus than disagreement. And I think Chris, John, Larry, and I, I'm not sure about Rosalind, could reach an agreement. <laughs> <laughs> but, on, but, on but, that, I do, but, I, I, but I do believe if you put the five of us in a room, we would get at least a super majority for those yes. principles. And yes. there will be, a, yes. and you were great at doing that when you were at the ACLU and doing internet work. and. So I actually think um, that that is a possibility, and I agree. And if you want, you know, the topic of this, the subject matter of this panel is fragmentation, and I think those principles need to be high enough up yes. so that they so that they work against fragmentation and towards a common set of beliefs and understanding and protections. Exactly right. So I've never met Jerry, but uh, he's a great guy. Don't worry. He, don't, don't. he seems like a you, great you guy. You like him, and, <laughs> and he's describing oh, what oh, you talk. Oh, Yes. Let's just talk about leadership. Yeah. The FCC began this conversation under Tom Wheeler when they voted 5-0 on a set of principles around the transition of the uh, network, what we were talking about earlier, to an all IP network. Some of those principles will work when you talk about edge companies. Some of them will not. But you can take some of those and translate them and have that conversation if people got together and talked about it. Yeah, I made one comment. Yeah. Yes. They may be the, 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 you know, the, the Bill of Rights. You won't get to Congress unless everyone has. Yes, a agree with that. And that was the sad thing that I found about that process. They had a 5-0 vote, and Congress was silent on it. There was no hearings. No one discussed it, uh, debated it. I mean, they don't have to agree, but to discuss it. I think we're unfortunately out of time, uh, but thank you guys for for attending and, and for thank listening. Thank you, Tara. And it's been a great hey, time. Principal.